the Bible, there was a party at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Martha got upset because Mary wasn't helping with the cooking. But Jesus said, Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word. I want to encourage you today. Why don't you choose that good part? Let's get into the word of God together. Some of you've heard bits and pieces of my story, and as I was praying about this evening, I felt like I should share a little of my story and then share a little bit from the Word. And I was raised in the area here, in a, a good family, not a Christian home. I uh, never heard the gospel as a kid and uh, kind of went a, a little bit south, and I can't blame it on anything other than um, my own excessive nature in the flesh. Uh, if I found something I liked, I always went to extremes with it. And uh, that, you know, temptation coupled with peer pressure, coupled with just sort of a, a bent nature, got me in a lot of trouble. I started drinking real heavy as a young kid. In fact, um, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade, I'd be showing up to school drunk in the morning. I'd get up, you know, an hour early just to drink a bottle of wine. Uh, by myself and go to school that way. And I was uh, drunk a lot at school. And eventually ended up uh, uh, on drugs as well. And uh, things kind of really, really got from bad to worse. And um, if you would have seen me, you would have thought pretty normal. I mean, I played baseball, I played sports, did all that kind of stuff. But there was uh, other things going on in my life. and. Like I said, probably a miracle I lived long enough to get saved. I passed out at the wheel more than once, uh, one time on the freeway, never got hurt miraculously. One time I woke up, I had passed out behind the wheel of my car, I woke up to a train going by. I had wrecked my car just a few feet from a train track and the train whizzing by in the morning is what woke me up and I went out and knocked on a door. This lady came to the door and said, excuse me, what city am I in? I had no idea where I was, didn't know what city I was in. I blacked out, and those kind of things happened often. And the last straw, when I really knew I was in trouble, I was, uh, well, I came to, I was in someone's front yard, and I had handfuls of grass and a mouthful of grass. I'd been eating grass out of somebody's yard due to uh, excessive drug use. And I remember that night thinking, Bayless, you have got a problem. And if you don't get out of the neighborhood, you're going to an early grave. And so I decided that I was going to leave Southern California and, and get away from my friends and no more drugs. That's it. I'm through. And I moved up to Oregon. I took a very small stash of drugs with me just in case I had a weak moment, <laughs> which actually happened the first day. I met a drug dealer I knew from Long Beach up in, in Ashland, Oregon. We went out and got high and, and well, things really went off the rails from there. And you might think that I wasn't looking for God, but I was. Um, I just never heard the gospel. I was in my 20s. No human being ever told me the story of redemption. No human being ever told me Jesus Christ was alive. No human being ever told me the story of salvation. No one. I, one of my best friends, he quit high school. We were buddies since elementary school. He quit high school, became a Hare Krishna, changed his name to Bopadev. And, uh, I would go to the big Krishna festivals. I read the Bhagavad Gita. I would go to the metaphysical church. I practiced kundalini yoga. I practiced Native American religions, mostly the ones where you got to take organic drugs in the ceremonies. But, <laughs> but I was searching. I even went and visited this lady that lived on top of a mountain that claimed that fly, when flying saucers would come over, the aliens would speak through her. I went to visit her. Man, I was, I was looking for the truth. And I'd thought about Christianity, and I sort of had this mental list, and it was dead last on my list. And, uh, well, it, it uh, was there, but I was eventually going to look into it. And a, a girlfriend gave me some drugs one night. I was supposed to disperse them to about 10 friends, but instead I took the whole batch myself and I almost died that night. And it was a, it was a bad night. And the next day I was extremely depressed and 
I was walking through a park, Lithia Park in Ashland, Oregon. I was walking down this sort of steep trail that, that went down into a playground area. And I found myself thinking about Jesus. But it wasn't the Jesus of the Bible. It was Jesus the guru, Jesus the good teacher, Jesus a great guy to pattern your life after. But I was thinking about Jesus. And I tried to think about something else, and my mind snapped right back to Jesus. It's like somebody's putting thoughts in my head. And I'm walking down this trail, and I stopped, and I looked up into the air, and I said, I said it out loud. And by myself, I said, OK, I'll think about Jesus. And I went on thinking about Jesus over and over and over. And I walked down through the kids' playground area. And it was, I don't know, 100, 150 kids just playing around. And a little Mexican boy walked by me, maybe 12 years old, had his hands in his pockets, pair of cowboy boots on. He never looked up at me. And when he walked by me, something brushed over my spirit. And I couldn't take my eyes off this kid. I knew whatever he had, it was good. It was wholesome. And whatever he had, I knew I did not have it intuitively. I knew he had something that was very good. And I, I literally got on my tiptoes and watched him till he disappeared across the other side of the park. And I thought, what did that kid have? And I went back to thinking about Jesus. And I walked back. And in that park, it, it turns into forest. And I walked way, way back into the woods and went down a, down a steep embankment. And I sat next to a creek on this rock. I didn't look much like I do now. I had long, long hair. I used to wear it braided with feathers in it. I had a long beard. And I'm sitting on this rock, thinking about Jesus, completely hidden from view. In about 10 minutes, that same kid comes sliding down the opposite creek bank and sits on a rock across the creek from me. And he just looks at me. I threw a stick in the water, and he threw a stick in the water. And he just stared at me for a while, and he said, can I ask you a question? I shook my head, yes. He said, do you know Jesus? And honestly, my thought when he asked me that, I, I thought to myself, this kid must think I'm Jesus. <laughs> That's what I thought. I said, come here. And he hops across the rock, sits next to me, and looks up in my face and says, isn't he wonderful? And he starts talking like Jesus is still alive or something. And he's going on and on about Jesus and this relationship and how wonderful Jesus is. And I'm thinking, you are weird. He says, come on, I want you to meet my mom. So I follow this kid across the park, back into the playground area. Here's this woman asleep in the grass. And she, he wakes her up. I still remember the imprinted, you know, blades of grass on her face. And he's like, they're like, look what I found, mom. <laughs> and so I talked to him for a while. And I, as I said, you know, I, I got to go. And as I'm leaving, her name was Ramona. She says, I want you to come to our house for dinner. And I said, no, thanks. You know, I, I got to go. It was nice meeting you. And I'm thinking in my, my head, you are the weirdest people I've ever met. And I, as I'm walking away, she said, we want you to come. And she shouts the address at my back as I'm walking away. I totally blew it off. And it was, I don't know, maybe, maybe two weeks later, I suddenly had an overwhelming desire to go to their house. And I remembered the address. Found the street, parked my pickup truck, and it was on an incline. I'm walking down the street. Here's Ramona. She's hanging out of a second story window. She goes, Bay. Everybody called me Bay back then. Bay, up here. And I saw her, and I went up, and they had dinner ready, and they had a place set for me. She said, We've been waiting for you to come. She said, The Lord told us you'd be here tonight. I was like, Excuse me. <laughs> And I used to have this habit of it. You know how we've all got our personal space? You're comfortable. If somebody gets too close, you're like. I used to have this habit of kind of invading people's space. And I, when she said, Jesus told us, I got this far away from her nose. And I said, who told you? And she looked right back at me and says, Jesus told us. We had spaghetti. <laughs> and. Uh, I began spending time with them and asking questions, and she would read scriptures to me and talk to me about Jesus. And I'd like to tell you I got saved right away. I did not. I left with a friend and moved down to Mexico City and uh, was involved in some illegal things down there, uh, some of it involving drugs and some other things. And uh, I was miserable. We had everything that I thought would make me happy down there. We had all of the drugs we wanted. I mean, we were with some of the wealthiest people down there. I remember we were at a party one night. This guy throws a kilo of pot in the fireplace just because he's bored. I mean, there was 
that much of an abundance of drugs. All the girls we wanted, we were, you know, living in a really nice place, and I'm miserable. At that time, there was 11 million people in Mexico City. I think there's like 27 million or something now. But I remember up on the, whatever, 35th floor of this building we were staying in, getting drunk every night and looking out over the lights of the city and thinking, why am I so miserable? I've got everything that I thought would make me happy. We've got girls, we've got drugs, we've got, got money, and I'm miserable. And I decided I'm going back to Oregon and I'm finding that kid and I'm finding his mother. And I told my friends, I said, I'm leaving. They said, when? I said, now. And I got in my truck, I bought a case of, of quarts of beer, and I went on a beer fast. And I drove 3,000 miles from Mexico City all the way back to Oregon. I pick up hitchhikers, give them a quart of beer, and uh, drove back to Oregon. Found those people and became increasingly convinced there was something to this Jesus thing but I had questions that I had no answers to. My friends had questions that I had no answers to. And I said, I, I don't know, but something's telling me this is real. And I was staying with some friends one night. Um, they lived back in the mountains and, and sort of on an isolated road. And I went outside and laid across the hood of my truck. And I was looking up in the sky. It was really late at night. And, and first time in my life I ever remember praying. I said, God, if this is true and Jesus is your son, this whole story about salvation is true. What about this? And I asked God a question, and I listened. No answer. I asked God another question. No answer. I started to cry, and I started yelling at God, and I yelled another question. Well, what about this? And what about this? And I yelled two or three questions and just nothing. I wiped the tears off my face, slid off the hood of that truck, and went, went in, went to sleep. And the next day, something amazing happened to me. God spoke to me. I don't know how I knew it was God, but intuitively, I knew it was God. He said, I want you to go to Ramona's house. I heard it in here. Just as clear as I've heard anything in my life, I heard it in my heart. I want you to go to Ramona's house, and I knew it was God. So I drove my truck, and they're getting ready to go somewhere. I said, where are you guys going? We're going to the next town, Medford, going to a street mission. God speaks to me a second time, as clear as anything I've ever heard. He said, I want you to go with them. And instead of agreeing internally, I said, no, I don't think so. I said, I don't want to. And in my heart, I said, God, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. If they invite me, I'll go. Immediately, Ramona wheels around, points at me, says, Babe, will you go with us? I said, okay. So we went, I sat on the front row. I had a pair of bright, skin-tight orange pants on with big yellow stripes down the side, a pair of big boots on. I remember sitting on the front row with my arms crossed, thinking, okay. And they had this gi ginormous lectern up there, and this little lady gets in front of it. They had some songs, and then she's going to give a testimony, and I have no idea what that means. And she proceeds to quote word for word the first question I'd asked God the night before laying across the hood of my pickup truck in the mountains, and then shared the answer from the Bible. And I started to cry. A guy gets up after her to give a testimony, but instead he quotes the second question I'd asked God the night before on the hood of my truck, shares the answer from the Bible. Somebody got up after him, quoted the questions I had shouted at God, shared the answer. And by this time, I'm on the front row. I am sobbing uncontrollably. I realized that it was true. I realized I'd been set up. And that night, I was the only person that responded when they gave the invitation. And I remember there was this big guy named Andy Green in fact, he started the first Calvary Chapel there in Ashland, Oregon. And Andy held me while I sobbed. I cried and 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 I cried, and I cried some more. Because I realized it was true. God had embraced me. And you know what? They laid hands on me and prayed for me. I've never had another drug in my body. It's been 37 years. I got set free that night. And, uh, you know, God meets us all where we need to be met. And God knew where I needed to be met. And I just want to tell you, I don't think it's a coincidence you're here tonight. I think there's a God in heaven that knows your name. 
He loves you unconditionally. And he wants you to know him. Would you look at a couple of verses with me, if you would? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Let me quote that to you from the New Living Translation. So listen to it. So we've stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them. Once I mistakenly thought of Christ that way, as though he were merely a human being, how differently I think about him now. Thought that Jesus was just a normal man and got it all wrong. You know, Isaiah said of Jesus, there's no beauty that we should desire him, no stately form, no majesty. Just a carpenter's son that looks fairly ordinary. But how wrong was that assessment? Outside, he may have appeared quite normal, but inside, he was deity. God in the flesh. And Paul, writing to the Corinthians, he says, listen, just like, you know, we got it wrong with Jesus, to, to judge him outwardly, you know, it was all wrong. So we've learned not to do that with people as well. We no longer look at people from a worldly point of view. Why? Verse 17 tells us why. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All right, someone might have been a selfish businessman and maybe earned that reputation, or a loose party girl, or a druggie, or a self-absorbed politician, or whatever. Those labels mean nothing once a person accepts Christ. All things become new. They change. And that literally means brand new, something that never existed before. The Greek word means an original, not some patched up, repainted version of the old you. But anyone that's in Christ becomes a brand new person. He puts a new spirit within you, my friend. Listen, if the Jesus that you accepted didn't change you from the inside out, you got the wrong Jesus. I just want you to know that. All right, verse 18. Look with me if you would. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. All right, all things are of God. In other words, God's the one that's done all this. You didn't do it. I didn't do it. Not personal sacrifice, not good works. It's all grace. God in the beginning, God in the middle, and God in the end. By grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Friend, it's not our personal sacrifice. It's not our good works that make us right with God. It's not giving in the offering that makes you right with God. It's embracing His Son, Jesus Christ, that makes you right. And I want you to notice what he said. All things are of God. In other words, God's done this, who has reconciled us to Himself. It's about relationship. It's not about religion. God has reconciled us to Himself. You know, that night in that little mission in Medford, Oregon, I met my creator. I came into a, a walking, talking, living, breathing relationship with God. Not about ritual. Not about ceremony. He reconciled me to himself. And he wants you to know him. And then the rest of this verse, check it out, verse 18. He's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. All right, you've been brought to God and He's given you something. Everybody say, I have something. I have something. You have a ministry. God has given you a ministry. The ministry of reconciliation. And see, what's happened is some people have altered the message. Instead of telling them, that God was personally present in Christ, not counting up your sins against you, but canceling them. He nailed them to his cross. They've changed the message to, you dirty sinner. God ought to grind you to powder. 
It's not the message we're to preach. Now, certainly there is a severe side of God, and you don't want to toy around with sin when you know better. But the truth is, you are loved by God. Ernest Hemingway, in his book, Capital of the World, tells the story of a father and son that had become estranged. Because of the son's rebellion, the father was finally fed up and kicked the boy out of the house, and they didn't talk and had no contact for a long period of time. Later on, the father thought better of it, regretted kicking the son out, and searched for his son and searched for his son and searched for his son, whose name was Paco, and he never found him. Finally, he went to the local paper there. It was in Madrid, Spain. And he took out a huge ad in the paper. He said, Paco, meet me tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. at the newspaper office. All is forgiven, your father. The father went there at 9 a.m. the next morning, and there were 600 Pacos <laughs> waiting at the newspaper office, all hoping to find reconciliation and forgiveness from their fathers. My friend, the world is looking to be reconciled. People need forgiveness, and they know it. And that's the message that we have. That's what I want to proclaim to you tonight. God is not mad at you. Jesus Christ has already paid the price to redeem you from your sins and from your lifestyle of sin. And you can walk away from this place changed tonight. Final two verses. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All right, you've been given a ministry. You're an ambassador. You're an ambassador to the other soccer moms that you meet with. You're an ambassador to the people you work with. You're an ambassador to your neighborhood. Notice what he said, as though God were pleading through us. I mean, what judge is going to plead with a convicted criminal to accept a pardon? What creditor is going to, you know, plead with some, you know, person whose life has been ruined by debt, hey, you, you need to, to accept, you know, a, a complete washing away of all your debt. No creditor would do that. No judge would do that. But that's what the God of the universe has done. We've offended His holiness, and yet He pleads, accept this pardon. Accept this reconciliation. Accept this forgiveness. What kind of a God is that? And if you'll, you'll listen to your heart, you will sense that compassion. The Bible says the love of God compels us. It's as though God was pleading through us. Be reconciled. For Jesus, who knew no sin as he hung upon Calvary's tree, was made to be sin for us, that we might be made right with God. And I want to say it again, it's not about religious ritual. It's not about empty ceremony. It's about a relationship. Jesus became the sacrifice for our sins. The depth of what that means, we'll never know. Jesus died. And after three days and three nights, the claims of God's eternal justice were forever satisfied. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was raised from the dead. And the Bible says, if you believe that, if you confess Him with your mouth as Lord, God brings you into a relationship with himself called salvation. I want to invite you to pray with me tonight. If you've never opened your heart to the Savior, or maybe you've had an encounter with Jesus at some point in your life, maybe as a young person, maybe you love Jesus as a child, but today you're not living for him. Your heart is far from God. And you know that if Jesus came back tonight, you would not be ready to meet him. Well, I've got good news. God's not mad at you. But it's time for you to come home, prodigal son. Time for you to come home, prodigal daughter. The longer you delay, the harder it becomes, and the harder your heart becomes 
This is your night. Just put a hand on your heart. Let's pray together. Just be sincere. Tie your heart around these words. Say, oh God, with all of my heart I come to you. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died on the cross to take away all my sins. That he was raised from the dead. Jesus, thank you for taking my place. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I put my trust in you alone. And from this moment forward, my life is not my own. All I am and all I have, I place in your hands, Jesus. Wherever you lead me, I will go. trust that the broadcast today was a blessing to you. I hope that you prayed the prayer. If you've never opened your heart to Jesus before, he will never, ever disappoint you. I'm going to ask a favor of you today. If you've never corresponded with us, we would love to hear from you. Love to hear your story. If the broadcast has touched your life, send us an email, write me a letter. It would encourage my heart. It would encourage the heart of our team. Let us know if you're watching and if the broadcast has meant anything to you or a loved one. Hope to hear from you. Till next time, God bless. Every one of us has a story, whether it's full of sadness, surprises, major change, or moments that seem to just suspend time. Some of the most powerful stories are of how God reveals His love for us. This message that I preach called God Pleading Through Us has gotten an amazing response as people have watched it on television. In it, I shared my testimony and, and shared just principles how God wants to use average, ordinary, everyday people, you know, to, to work miracles and to influence people and to bring His Word to people. I have another resource called There's Always Hope, and this is my testimony in its entirety. And if there's anyone in your world that seems hopeless, seems like they're just too far gone, that they're unreachable, I'm telling you, there is always hope. Use the information on your screen, and as a thank you for your gift, we'll send you both powerful messages about the love of Christ.